This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Kingdom of Childhood. Lecture 5, given in Torquay on August 16, 1924. It is essential that you have some understanding of the real essence of every subject that you teach, so that you do not use things in your teaching that are remote from life itself. Everything that is intimately connected with life can be understood. I could even say that whatever one really understands has this intimate connection with life. This is not the case with abstractions. Today we find that teachers' ideas are largely abstractions, so that, in many respects, the teachers themselves are remote from life. This is a source of great difficulties in education and teaching. Just consider the following. Imagine that you want to think over how you first came to count things and what really happens when you count. You will probably find that the thread of your recollections breaks somewhere and that you did once learn to count, but actually you do not really know what you do when you count. Now, all kinds of theories are thought out for the teaching of numbers and counting, and it is customary to act upon such theories. But even when external results can be obtained, the whole being of the child is not touched with this kind of counting or with similar things that have no connection with real life. The modern age has proved that it lives in abstractions by inventing such things as the abacus or bead frame for teaching. In a business office, people can use calculating machines as much as they like. That does not concern us at the moment. But in teaching, this calculating machine which is exclusively concerned with the activities of the head, prevents you from the very start from dealing with numbers in accordance with the child's nature. Counting, however, should be derived from life itself. And here it is supremely important to know from the beginning that you should not ever expect a child to understand every single thing you teach. Children must take a great deal on authority, but they must take it in a natural, practical way. Perhaps you may find that what I am now going to say will be rather difficult for the child, but that does not matter. It is of great significance that there should be moments in a person's life when in the thirtieth or fortieth year one could say to oneself, Now I understand what, in my eighth or ninth year, or even earlier, I took on authority. This awakens new life in a person. But if you look at all the object lessons that are introduced into the teaching of today, you may well be in despair over the way things are trivialized, in order, as one says, to bring them nearer to the child's understanding. Now, imagine that you have quite a young child in front of you, one who still moves quite clumsily, and you say, You are standing there before me, Here I take a piece of wood and a knife and I cut the wood into pieces. Can I do that to you? The child will see that I cannot do it. And now I can say, Look, if I can cut the piece of wood in two, the wood is not like you, and you are not like the wood, for I cannot cut you in two like that. So there is a difference between you and the wood. The difference lies in the fact that you are a unit, a one, and the wood is not a one. You are a unit and I cannot cut you in two, and therefore I call you one, a unit. You can now gradually proceed to show the child a sign for this one. You make a stroke, one, so that you show it is a unit, and you make this stroke for it. Now you can leave this comparison between the wood and the child, and you can say, Look, here is your right hand but you have another hand to your left hand. If you only had this one hand, you could certainly move about everywhere as you do, but if your hand were only to follow the movement of your body, you could never touch yourself in the way your two hands can touch each other. For when this hand moves and the other hand moves at the same time, then you can take hold of each other. They can take hold of each other. They can come together. That is different from when you simply move alone. 
in that you walk alone you are a unit, but the one hand can touch the other hand. This is no longer a unit, this is a duality, a two. See, you are one, but you have two hands. This you then show like this, one-one. In this way you can work out a conception of the one and the two from the child's own form. Now you call out another child and say, When you two walk toward each other, you can also meet and touch each other. There are two of you, but a third can join you. This is impossible with your hands. Thus you can proceed to the three, one, one, one. In this manner, you can derive numbers out of the, what the human being is itself. You can lead over to numbers from the human being, who is not an abstraction, but a living being. Then you can say, Look, you can find the number two somewhere else in yourself. The children will think finally of their two legs and feet. Now you say, You have seen your neighbor's dog, haven't you? Does the dog only go on two feet also? Then the children will come to realize that the four strokes, one, 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 are a picture of the neighbor's dog propped up on four legs, and thus will gradually learn to build up numbers out of life. The teacher's eyes must always be alert and look at everything with understanding. Now you naturally begin to write numbers with Roman figures, because the children, of course, will immediately understand them. And when you have got to the four, you will easily be able, with the hand, to pass over to five, V. You will soon see that if you keep back your thumb, you can use this four as the dog does. One, 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 one. Now you add the thumb and make five, and make V. I was once with a teacher who had got up to this point in explaining the Roman figures and could not see why it occurred to the Romans not to make five strokes next to one another but to make this sign V for the five. He got on quite well up to one, 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 one. Then I said, Now let us do it like this. Let us spread out our fingers and our thumb so that they go in two groups. And there we have it, V. Here we have the whole hand in the Roman five, and this is how it actually originated. The whole hand is there within it. In a short lecture course of this kind, it is only possible to explain the general principle. But in this way, we can derive the idea of numbers from real life. And only when a number has thus been worked out straight from life should you try to introduce counting by letting the numbers follow each other. But the children should take an active part in it. Before you come to the point of saying, now, tell me the numbers in order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. You should start with a rhythm. Let us say we are going from 1 to 2. Then it will be 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Let the child stamp on 2. And then on to 3, also in rhythm, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. In this way we bring rhythm into the series of numbers, and thereby, too, we foster the child's faculty of comprehending the thing as a whole. This is the natural way of teaching the children numbers, out of the reality of what numbers are. For people generally think that numbers were thought out by adding one to the other. This is quite untrue, for the head does not do the counting at all. In ordinary life, people have no idea what a peculiar organ the human head really is and how useless it is for our earthly life. It is there for beauty's sake, it is true, because our faces please each other. It has many other virtues too, but as far as spiritual activities are concerned, it is really not nearly so much in evidence, for the spiritual qualities of the head always lead back to a person's former earth life. The head is a metamorphosis of the former life on earth, and the fact of having a head only begins to have a real meaning when we know something of our former earthly lives. All other activities come from somewhere else, not from the head at all. The truth is that we count subconsciously on our fingers. 
In reality, we count from 1 to 10 on our 10 fingers, then 11, adding the toes, 12, 13, 14, counting on the toes. You cannot see what you are doing, but you go up to 20. And what you do in this manner with your fingers and toes only throws its reflection into the head. The head only looks on at all that occurs. The head is really only an apparatus for reflecting what the body does. The body thinks. The body counts. The head is only a spectator. We can find a remarkable analogy for this human head. If you have a car and are sitting comfortably inside it, you are doing nothing yourself. It is the chauffeur in front who has to exert himself. You sit inside and are driven through the world. So it is with the head. It does not toil and moil. It simply sits on the top of your body and lets itself be carried quietly through the world as a spectator. All that is done in spiritual life is done from the body. Mathematics is done by the body. Thinking is also done by the body. And feeling, too, is done with the body. The bead frame has arisen from the mistaken idea that reckoning is done with the head. Sums are then taught to the child with the bead frame. That is to say, the child's head is made to work, and then the head passes on the work to the body, for it is the body that must do the reckoning. This fact, that the body must do the reckoning, is not taken into account, but it is important. So it is right to let the children count with their fingers and also with their toes, for indeed it is good to call forth the greatest possible skill in the children. In fact, there is nothing better in life than making the human being skillful in every way. This cannot be done through sports, for sports do not really make people skilled. What does make a person skilled is holding a pencil between the big toe and the next toe and learning to write with the foot, to write figures with the foot. This can be of real significance. For in truth the person is permeated with soul and spirit in the whole body. The head is the traveler that sits back restfully inside and does nothing, while the body, every part of it, is the chauffeur who has to do everything. Thus, from the most varied sides, you must try to build up what the child has to learn as counting. And, when you have worked in this way for a time, it is important to pass on and not merely take counting by adding one thing to another. Indeed, this is the least important aspect of counting, and you should teach the child as follows. This is something that is one. Now you divide it like this, and you have something that is two. It is not two ones put together, but the two come out of the one, and so on, with three and four. Thus you can awaken the thought that the one is really the comprehensive thing that contains within itself the two, the three, the four. And if you learn to count in the way indicated in the diagram, one, two, three, four, and so on, then the child will have concepts that are living and thereby come to experience something of what it is to be inwardly permeated with the element of number. In the past, our modern conceptions of counting by placing one bean beside another or one bean beside another in the frame were quite unknown. In those days it was said that the unit was the largest, every two is only half of it, and so on. So you come to understand the nature of counting by actually looking at external objects. You should develop the child's thinking by means of external things that can be seen and keep as far away as possible from abstract ideas. The children can then gradually learn the numbers up to a certain point. First, let us say, up to twenty, then up to a hundred, and so on. If you proceed on these lines, you will be teaching them to count in a living way. I should like to emphasize that this method of counting, real counting, should be presented before the children learn to do sums. They ought to be familiar with this kind of counting before you go on to arithmetic. Arithmetic, too, must be drawn out of life. The living thing is always a whole, 
and must be presented as a whole first of all. It is wrong for children to have to put together a whole out of its parts, when they should be taught to look first at the whole and then divide this whole into its parts. Get them first to look at the whole and then divide it and split it up. This is the right path to a living conception. Many of the effects of our materialistic age on the general culture of humankind pass unnoticed. Nowadays, for instance, no one is scandalized but regards it rather as a matter of course to let children play with boxes of bricks and build things out of the single blocks. This of itself leads them away from what is living. There is no impulse in the child's nature to put together a whole out of parts. The child has many other needs and impulses that are admittedly much less convenient. If you give a, gi- if you give a child a watch, for instance, the child's immediate desire is to pull it to pieces, to break up the whole into its parts, which is actually far more in accordance with human nature, to see how the whole arises out of its components. This is what must now be taken into account in our arithmetic teaching. It has an influence on the whole of culture, as you will see from the following example. In the conception of human thought, up to the 13th and 14th centuries, very little emphasis was placed upon putting together a whole out of its parts. This arose later. Master builders built much more from the idea of the whole, which they then split up into parts, rather than starting with the single parts and making a building out of these. The latter procedure was really only introduced into civilization later on. This conception then led to people thinking of every single thing as being put together out of the very smallest parts. Out of this arose the atomic theory in physics, which really only comes from education. For atoms are really tiny little caricatures of demons, and our learned scholars would not speak about them as they do unless people had grown accustomed in education to putting everything together out of its parts. Thus it is that atomism has arisen. We criticize atomism today, but criticism is really more or less superfluous, because people cannot get free from what they have been used to thinking wrongly for the last four or five centuries. They have become accustomed to go from the parts to the whole, instead of letting their thoughts pass from the whole to the parts. This is something you should particularly bear in mind when teaching arithmetic. If you are walking toward a distant wood, you first see the wood as a whole, and only when you come near to it, near it, do you perceive that it is made up of single trees. This is just how you must proceed in arithmetic. You never have in your purse, let us say, one, two, three, four, five coins, but you have a heap of coins. You have all five together, which is a whole. This is what you have, first of all. And when you cook pea soup, you do not have one, two, three, four, five, or up to thirty or forty peas, but you have one heap of peas. Or with a basket of apples, for instance, there are not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven apples, but one heap of apples in your basket. You have a whole. What does it matter, to begin with, how many you have? You simply have a heap of apples that you are now bringing home. There are, let us say, three children. You will now, you will not now divide them so that each gets the same, for perhaps one child is small, another big. You put your hand into the basket and give the bigger child a bigger handful, the smaller child a smaller handful. You divide your heap of apple, apples into three parts. Dividing or sharing out is, in any case, such a strange business. There was once a mother who had a large piece of bread. She said to her little boy, Henry, divide the bread, but you must divide it in a Christian way. Then Henry said, What does that mean, divide it in a Christian way? Well, said his mother, you must cut the bread into two pieces, one larger and one smaller. Then you must give the larger piece to your sister Anna and keep the smaller one for yourself. Whereupon Henry said, Oh, well, in that case, let Anna divide it in a Christian way. (laughs) Other conceptions must come to your aid here. We will do it like this. 
that we give this to one child, let us say, and there's a drawing, and this heap to the second child, and this to the third, they have already learned to count. And so that we get a clear idea of the whole thing, we will first count the whole heap. There are eighteen apples. Now I have to count up what they each have. How many does the first child get? Five. How many does the second child get? Four. And the third? Nine. Thus I have started from the whole, from the heap of apples, and have divided it up into three parts. Arithmetic is often taught by saying, You have five, and here is five again, and eight. Count them together, and you have eighteen. Here you are going from the single thing to the whole, but this will give the child dead concepts. The child will not gain living concepts by this method. Proceed from the whole, from the eighteen, and divide it up into the addenda. That is how to teach addition. Thus in your teaching you must not start with the single addenda, but start with the sum, which is the whole, and divide it up into the single addenda. Then you can go on to show that it can be divided up differently, with different addenda, but the whole always remains the same. By taking addition in this way, not as is very often done by having first the addenda and then the sum, but by taking the sum first and then the addenda, you will arrive at conceptions that are living and mobile. You will always come to see that when it is only a question of a pure number, the whole remains the same, but the single addenda can change. This peculiarity of number, that you can think of the addenda grouped in different ways, is very clearly brought out by this method. From this you can proceed to show the children that when you have something that is not itself a pure number, but that contains a number within it, as the human being, for example, then you cannot divide it up in all these different ways. Take the human trunk, for instance, and what is attached to it, head, two arms and hands, two feet. You cannot now divide up the whole as you please. You cannot say, now I will cut out one foot like this, or the hand like this, and so on, for it has already been membered by nature in a definite way. When this is not the case, and it is simply a question of pure counting, then I can divide things up in different ways. Such methods as these will make it possible for you to bring life and a kind of living mobility into your work. All pedantry will disappear, and you will see that something comes into your teaching that the child badly needs. Humor comes into the teaching, not in a childish, but in a healthy sense. And humor must find its place in teaching. Footnote. At this point, Dr. Steiner turned to the translator and said, Please be sure you translate the word humor properly, for it is always misunderstood in connection with teaching. End of footnote. This, then, must be your method. Always proceed from the whole. Suppose you had such an example as the following, taken from real life. A mother sent Mary to fetch some apples. Mary got twenty-five apples. The apple woman wrote it down on a piece of paper. Mary comes home and brings only ten apples. The fact is before us, an actual fact of life, that Mary got twenty-five apples and only brought home ten. Mary is an honest little girl, and she really didn't eat a single apple on the way, and yet she only brought home ten. And now someone comes running in, an honest person, bringing all the apples that Mary dropped on the way. Now there arises the question, how many does this person bring? You see him coming from a distance, but we want to know beforehand how many he is going to bring. Mary has come home with ten apples, and she got twenty-five, for there it is on the paper written down by the apple woman, and now we want to know how many this person ought to be bringing, for we do not yet know if he is honest or not. What Mary brought was ten apples, and she got twenty-five, so she lost fifteen apples. Now, as you see, the sum is done. The usual method is that something is given, and you have to take away something else, and something is left. But in real life you may easily convince yourselves of this. It happens much more often that you know what you originally had, and you know what is left over, and you have to find out what was lost. Starting with the minuend and the subtrahend, 
and working out the remainder is a dead process. But if you start with the minuend and the remainder and have to find the subtrahend, you will be doing subtraction in a living way. This is how you may bring life into your teaching. You will see this if you think of the story of Mary and her mother and the person who brought the subtrahend. You will see that Mary lost the subtrahend from the minuend and that has to be justified by knowing how many apples the person you see coming along will have to bring. Here life, real life, comes into your subtraction. If you say, so much is left over, this only brings something dead into the child's soul. You must always be thinking of how you can bring life, not death, to the child in every detail of your teaching. You can continue in this way. You can do multiplication by saying, here we have the whole, the product. How can we find out how many times something is contained in this product? This thought has life in it. Just think how dead it is when you say, we will divide up this whole group of people, here are three, here are three more, and so on, and then you ask, how many times three have we here? That is dead. There is no life in it. If you proceed the other way round and take the whole, and ask how often one group is contained within it, then you bring life into it. You can say to the children, for instance, Look, there is a certain number of you here. Then let them count up. How many times are these five contained within the forty-five? Here again you consider the whole and not the part. How many more of these groups of five can be made? Then it is found out that there are eight more groups of five. Thus, when you do the thing the other way round and start with the whole, the product, and find out how often one factor is contained in it, you bring life into your arithmetical methods, and above all you begin with something that the children can see before them. The chief point is that thinking must never, never be separated from visual experience, from what the children can see, for otherwise intellectualism and abstractions are brought to the children in early life and thereby ruin their whole being. The children will become dried up, and this will affect not only the soul life, but the physical body also, causing desiccation and sclerosis. I shall later have to speak of the education of spirit, soul, and body as a unity. Here again, much depends on our teaching arithmetic in the way we have considered, so that in old age, the human being is still mobile and skillful. You should teach the children to count from their own bodies, as I have described, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, first with the fingers and then with the toes. Yes, indeed, it would be good to accustom the children actually to count up to twenty with their fingers and toes, not on a bead frame. If you teach them thus, then you will see that through this childlike kind of meditation you are bringing life into the body. For when you count on your fingers or toes, you have to think about these fingers and toes, and this is then a meditation, a healthy kind of meditating on one's own body. Doing this will allow the grown person to remain skillful of limb in old age. The limbs can still function fully because they have learned to count by using the whole body. If a person only thinks with the head rather than with the limbs and the rest of the organism, then later on the limbs lose their function and gout sets in. This principle, that everything in teaching and education must be worked out from what can be seen, but not from what are often called object lessons today, this principle I should like to illustrate for you with an example, something that can actually play a very important part in teaching. I am referring to the theorem of Pythagoras, that, as would-be teachers, you must all be well acquainted with, and that you may even have already come to understand in a similar way. But I will speak of it again today. Now, the theorem of Pythagoras can be taken as a kind of goal in the teaching of geometry. You can build up your geometry lessons to reach their climax, their summit, in the theorem of Pythagoras, which states that the square on the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares, on the other two sides. It is a marvelous thing if you see it in the right light. 
I once had to teach geometry to an elderly lady because she loved it so much. She may have forgotten everything, I do not know, but she had probably not learned much at her school, one of those schools for the, quote, education of young ladies, close quote. At all events, she knew no geometry at all, so I began and made everything lead up to the theorem of Pythagoras, which the old lady found very striking. We are so used to it that it no longer strikes us so forcibly. But what we have to understand is simply that if I have a right-angled triangle, here, and there's a diagram, the area of the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the other two areas, the two squares, on the other two sides. So that if I am planting potatoes and put them at the same distance from each other everywhere, I shall plant the same number of potatoes in the two smaller fields together as in the larger one. This is something very remarkable, very striking. And when you look at it like this, you cannot really see how it comes about. It is just this fact of the wonder of it, that you cannot see how it comes about, that you must make use of to bring life into the more inward soul quality of your teaching. You must build on the fact that here you have something that is not easily discernible, This must constantly be acknowledged. One might even say, with regard to the theorem of Pythagoras, that you can believe it, but you always have to lose your belief in it again. You have to believe afresh every time that this square is equal to the sum of the other two squares. Now, of course, all kinds of proofs can be found for this, but the proof ought to be given in a clear visual way. Parenthesis, Dr. Steiner then built up a proof for the theorem of Pythagoras in detail based on the superposition of areas. He gave it in the conversational style used in this lecture course and with the help of the blackboard and colored chalks. For those who are interested in a verbatim report of this, a proof with diagrams can be found in the appendix on pages 88 to 90. Close parenthesis. If you use this method of proof, that is, laying one area over the other, you will discover something. If you cut it out instead of drawing it, you will see that it is quite easy to understand. Nevertheless, if you think it over afterward, you will have forgotten it again. You must work it out afresh every time. You cannot easily hold it in your memory, and therefore you must rediscover it every time. That is a good thing, a very good thing. It is in keeping with the nature of the theorem of Pythagoras. You must arrive at it afresh every time. You should always forget that you have understood it. This belongs to the remarkable quality of the theorem of Pythagoras itself, and thereby you can bring life into it. You will soon see that if you make your pupils do it again and again, they have to ferret it out by degrees. They do not get it at once. They have to think it out each time. But this is in accordance with the inner, living quality of the theorem of Pythagoras. It is not good to give a proof that can be understood in a flat, dry kind of way. It is much better to forget it again constantly and work it out every time afresh. This is inherent in the very wonder of it, that the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the squares on the other two sides. With children of eleven or twelve, You can quite well take geometry up to the point of explaining the theorem of Pythagoras by this comparison of areas, and the children will enjoy it immensely when they have understood it. They will be enthusiastic about it and will always be wanting to do it again, especially if you let them cut it out. There will perhaps be a few intellectual good-for-nothings who remember it quite well and can always do it again, but most of the children, being more reasonable, will cut it out wrong again and again and have to puzzle it out till they discover how it has to go. That is just the wonderful thing about the theorem of Pythagoras, and you should not forsake this realm of wonder, but should remain within it. That is the end of Lecture 5. I'm going to read the proof, even though the pictures are not there, so if you wanted to stop now, you could. This is the appendix to Lecture 5, the proof of the theorem of Pythagoras. It's about two pages long. Proof for the Theorem of Pythagoras As it has been impossible to reproduce the diagrams in color, 
The forms that Dr. Steiner prefer, refer, excuse me, referred to by their colors have been indicated by letters or numbers. It is quite easy to do this proof if the triangle is isosceles. If you have here a right-angled isosceles triangle, see diagram A, then this is one side, this is the other, and this is the hypotenuse. The square, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is in the center, is the square on the other two sides. Now if I plant potatoes evenly in these two fields, 2 and 5, and 4 and 6, I shall get just as many as if I plant potatoes in this field, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4 is the square on the hypotenuse, and the two fields, 2, 5, and 4, 6, are the squares on the other two sides. You can make the proof quite obvious by saying the parts, 2 and 4, of the two smaller squares fall into this space here, 1, 2, 3, 4, the square on the hypotenuse. They are already within it. The part 5 exactly fits into the space 3, and if you cut out the whole thing, you can take the triangle 6 and apply it to 1, and you will see at once that it is the same. So that the proof is quite clear if you have a so-called right-angled isosceles triangle. If, however, you have a triangle that is not isosceles, but has unequal sides, see the second diagram, you can do it as follows. Draw the triangle again, ABC, then draw the square on the hypotenuse, ABDE. Proceed as follows. Draw the triangle, ABC, again over here, DBF. Then this triangle, ABC, or DBF, which is the same, can be put up there, AGE. Sorry, this is difficult without the diagram, I realize. Since you now have this triangle repeated over there, you can draw the square over one of the other sides, C-A-G-H. As you can see, I can now also draw this triangle, D-E-I, congruent to B-C-A. Then the square, D-I-H-F, is the square on the other side. Here I have both the square on the one side and the square on the other side. In the one case, I use the side AG, and in the other case, the side DI. The two triangles, AEG and DEI, are congruent. Where is then the square on the hypotenuse? It is the square ABDE. Now I have to show from the figure itself that 1, 2, and 3, 4, 5 together make up 2, 4, 6, 7. Now I first take the square 1, 2. This has the triangle 2 in common with the square on the hypotenuse, ABDE, and section 4 of the square on the other side, HIDF, is also contained in ABDE. Thus I get this picture, 2, 4, which you see drawn here and which is actually a piece of the square, ABDE. This only leaves parts 1, 3, and 5 of the squares AGHC and DIHF to be fitted into the square on the hypotenuse ABDE. Now you can take part 5 and lay it over part 6, but you will still have this corner 1, 3 left over. If you cut this out, you will discover that these two areas, 1, 3, fit into this area, 7. Of course, it can be drawn more clearly, but I think you will understand the process. That is the end of the appendix to Lecture 5 and the end of the whole reading of Lecture 5.